My name is Katie Drasser, and I'm the Managing Director of the Aspen Global Innovators Group at the Aspen Institute, which along with the Health Medicine and Society Program hosts the annual Aspen Ideas Health event. So I want to thank you all today for joining. I can see folks joining from around the world, and we're so happy that you're here with us. Um, while the pandemic is preventing us from gathering in person in Aspen this summer, we're excited to continue to host these conversations between leading health practitioners, advocates, artists, scientists, and innovators on our digital channel. You can find all of our programming on our website at aspenideashealth.org, and we hope you continue to join in. So today, we are thrilled to be hosting this conversation between iGem Poo, co-director, co-founder of Caring Cross Generations and executive director of the National Domestic Health Workers Alliance. Uh, she is joined with Dr. Lucy Kalanithi, the Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at Stanford University and dear friend. Both of these amazing women have been featured presenters on the stage at Aspen Ideas Health, but they've never actually been in conversation with each other. So this is a first. And knowing these two, you can expect, expect a fiercely intelligent, personal, inspirational and educational conversation grounded in dignity and hope um, about the important role of caregivers during this time and the impact the pandemic is having on essential workers and what it's like to be on the front lines in this moment. So we are truly honored to have both iGen and Lucy with us today. So thank you both for being here. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to Lucy. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm so um, very excited to be part of this conversation. Um, I just wanted to ask if people want to add um, in the comments or Q&A where you are joining us from. We'd love to see. Um, and I'm thrilled to talk with you, iGen. I've been so excited to do this um, together. And just to mention for people, in addition to her work leading uh, the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Caring Across Generations, iGen's book is The Age of Dignity. Her podcast, co-hosted with Alicia Garza, is Sunstorm. And then she's also a co-founder of Supermajority, which is mobilizing women as a force for change. And now a member of the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we're so thrilled to hear from your expertise during this time. And I think, um, you know, just to say, your work is long focused on valuing and uplifting and protecting frontline workers, particularly in our homes, domestic workers, direct care workers, caregivers, um, and bringing for those people a legal framework and a cultural narrative that values the indispensability of them and of their lives. And I think it's a very interesting time um, to see what you've been doing during the COVID pandemic. And then I'm thrilled to talk with you about how you picture this moving your work forward um, and, and sort of taking a narrative into the future. And I think, I also just wanna say as a person, so I'm a doctor, I was a caregiver to my late husband who died of cancer. I'm a single mom and I'm a daughter. So I think about your leadership and what you are doing um, to put structures in place um, for all of us in America. And um, I admire your work so much, particularly because I think you take the moral case and the economic case and intersect them, which is very exciting. Um, and you are also really a master of narrative. So partly the stories of individual people and um, uplifting their, the story of their lives, but also cultural narrative and reframing. And I think I'd love to like point that out today when we're talking, because I think I remember like literally where I was when I read your piece initially last year about universal family care and how that's a total reframing of caregiving from family caregiving from a individual responsibility and problem at times to a, a collective issue with collective solutions across the nation that we can all be part of and join in on and rely on. So um, anyway, this is by way of saying I'm a huge fan. I'm thrilled to talk with you um, about your thinking and writing and leadership um, now and across time. So um, thank you for being here. Welcome. And um, 
uh, I was hoping we might be able to start just by hearing um, what is essential work definitionally and then sort of what is the what is the notion of essential work mean and what is the Okay, this is a bunch of questions, but sort of like, what have people been getting wrong about essential work maybe? And then what is the pandemic putting right about uh, that notion? Hmm. Um, well, first I just wanna say that I almost cried during your opening framing just now because you are such a hero and shiro to so many of us and your voice and your, like the humanity just comes through every pore of your body um, as you speak, as you write, as you lead. And um, I've just, I'm so honored to be able to talk with you today and to hopefully work together after this. Um, That's a great plan. Thanks, Aija. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I think about this crisis, I really think a lot about how much it has revealed about what we actually need as human beings to be safe and be healthy. And this idea of essential has been such an important word for us because I think it's all just kind of been disrupted. Uh, what we understand to be essential and not essential. Um, I think there's just been a hugely helpful disruption that has happened where all of this work that we have taken for granted that hasn't been visible to us mm -hmm. and certainly hasn't been valued is now understood to be seen as is it understood to be essential and that frame of who is essential keeps opening up in a way that i think is so powerful and so important as somebody who's organized with domestic workers who are almost the archetypal invisible worker for 20 some years the fact that people are now seeing house cleaners and nannies and caregivers as part of the essential workforce is such a profound breakthrough to me and an opening in our culture to really value all work differently and everyone who contributes in a different way and once you see right when something becomes visible you can't unsee yeah and that to me i think is the power of this moment and certainly it's not an opening that that is inevitable in terms of its permanence or what its impact will be in terms of policy and systems and i think that piece is up to us mm -hmm. can you talk about um who is on the front line of care? Because I think a lot of people are thinking of the front line, despite what you said, the front line of healthcare um, as doctors and nurses, right? Or with inside the walls of the healthcare system in hospitals and clinics. But definitely the front line is extending in the ways you're describing and it extends into nursing homes and then in the home, mm -hmm. um, of course. And so could you talk about who the essential workforce is um, demographically and what that looks like. And um, uh, yeah, can you have yeah. any people? I mean, the first person who popped into my mind is Maggie, who is a home care worker in Chicago. And um, she has a client that she visits every day and provides life-saving connection to the world, everything from bringing food to medication to just some human contact and sense of connection to the world. And um, she has, you know, she's been doing this work for many years and has really struggled to make ends meet. There was no money to stock up on groceries or supplies and she now has a 12 year old who's home from school who she brings with her on the bus wow. to get to her client every day and so the two of them are on the front line of making sure that her client is safe and healthy and is a part of ensuring that older people some of the most vulnerable people to the crisis can stay safe in their homes and not overrun our healthcare system or, right, it's such an important part of flattening the curve and, um, and keeping us all safe. And she has no PPE, she has no protective equipment, she has no access to testing or care, she has no paid time off or paid sick days, and she is really one of millions of disproportionately women, many women of color, 
who are in low wage service prof professions where the wages have not been enough to make ends meet, let alone um, provide any kind of economic resilience in a time of crisis. There's been no paid time off, no access to a safety net. And so this whole layer of essential work that we're starting to recognize as essential is where our safety net has failed the most and where it's actually showing us just how unsafe it is. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because in a time where like, I keep thinking about this paradox of um, in such a lonely disease where separation is a key part of what's necessary, it's like distance is a form of love right now, you know, like you have to be six feet. That's a way to love other people, right? Okay. And the way to love your patients is to put on this space suit, right? But for people who, like you're describing, who are in situations where they can't be distanced with no sick leave or no PPE for themselves, um, there's a flip side to it, right? Like if you, if distance is love and like what is lack of distance and lack of protection and lack of safety like it is not love you know it's not justice like like makes me think of um cornell west said justice is what love looks like in public i just feel mm -hmm. like that um that's, that's my reaction to what you're saying that's right. um and there's so many families who i think i mean i think right now so much of our center of gravity has come has returned to the home Right? Yeah. We're all yeah. in our homes, yeah. we're all isolated from each other. And in some ways, I think the front line begins there. Right? So many of us are in new realities when it comes to caregiving. And we're all part of keeping ourselves and our families and our communities safe. Mm -hmm. And yet we're all so isolated in it. And I think this has given us a whole new context to understand the value of caregiving in general and just how little we have taken collective responsibility for how we take care of each other, right? It's like seen as this personal responsibility that you're just supposed to woman up and figure it out, how you're gonna take care of your kids and how you're gonna be a good daughter and take care of your parents. And in the end, it's actually impossible to do alone. It is a collective responsibility and this crisis has just put that into such sharp relief for so many people and so when I think of a frontline worker I also think of the single mom yeah. and I think of the, the when I think of the essential I think of the children who are trying to manage their parents getting evacuated from nursing homes and yes. figuring out what it means to provide that direct care mm -hmm. on top of everything else and sometimes it's the sandwich of figuring out both generations and across generations how we care for each other and that is part of i think what we need to see as the front line in this moment mm -hmm. i'd love to hear from you what your organizations have been doing at this moment in terms of thinking about policy moving forward but also direct support for people who are in these situations and i know i've heard you say that um, the ndwa went into rapid response mode at the beginning when it became clear what this pandemic was going to mean for people immediately. Um, so can you talk about what what has come out, what your work is right now in rapid response mode and why that happened? Yeah, well, so the first issue was we started to see dramatic losses in income very early on, long before the stay-at-home orders. House cleaners were having jobs, job cancellations, nannies were losing their jobs and not sure if they would be rehired and when. Um, and so people needed immediate financial assistance and it for food, for um, to pay the phone bills so their kids could have access to remote learning, at least through the phones, because they don't have computers or just basic essentials. So we created the Coronavirus Care Fund to provide emergency assistance to domestic workers and caregivers in need. And, um, and so that was the first and the first instance. And then the second piece was really and that's something, by the way, that anybody can donate to. So it's like people who are watching this can go yeah. and find coronavirus care fund and donate, right? Yes. And pay their own workers if they are employing people in their homes, right? 
Yes. And so that's the second piece is for people who are continuing to work through the crisis. If you are the nanny for the emergency room doctor who's working around the clock, or you are the caregiver like Maggie, who continues to support older clients, we created a COVID ready certificate program, like a training program to help caregivers understand how to continue to work through the crisis and keep yourself and your clients safe um, at, to the best of our ability, huh. right? Um, and so there's resources and training available. And most recently, what we've heard is that there's just huge um, stress, anxiety, and emotional support needs. So we created a peer-to-peer -peer emotional support text line called Care Together. So if you are a caregiver and you don't have to be a professional caregiver, even a family caregiver, and you just need some support. Oh, that's for everybody. Oh, that's for right everybody. in that way. Ah. Yeah, okay. you can go to Care Together. And, um, and there's a whole team of amazing counselors who are ready to support you. Mm. Um, and we're hearing now that people are starting to go back to work mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and really concerned about what that looks like, how to stay safe. And so we've just launched today, this afternoon, actually um, re-entry guidelines to help families and workers um, think about how to go back to work uh, in a way that is as safe as possible under the mm -hmm. circumstances. And, um, and that can be found on our website as well, domesticworkers.org. Um, and I will say that all of these things are incredibly important and they can never replace what the government can do in terms of offering relief and support mm -hmm. and access to a real safety net right now. So we're really encouraging people to call members of Congress and say to them that you support essential workers having protections everything from hazard pay to PPE to childcare support, um, all the things that people need to stay safe in this moment, and that you really want it, relief to be inclusive. And we've worked really closely with Congressman Ho Congresswoman, Ca Congresswoman Holland and Congressman Castro mm -hmm. on lifting up caregivers in that context and offering a framework for how we support both family caregivers and um, professional caregivers in the relief efforts. And is that the HEROES Act specifically or other things like, okay, I'm just going to say the capital switchboard phone number right now. And then if there are like real specifics <laughs> to, for people to name, because I know the HEROES Act is one of them too, right? So if you're going to call the capital switchboard, 202-224-3121, 202-224-3121. Please do it after this call, write it down exactly. and call after this, right? So, um, and and so what you just said, right? Um, caregivers, essential workers, protections, support, have it be inclusive. Exactly. And the HEROES Act is one thing that you are um, yeah. a fan and of. There yeah. are some important provisions in the HEROES Act for essential workers and caregivers, and it's really just the beginning of what's needed. You mentioned universal family care before, and um, I think that this is an opportunity for us to really invest in our caregivers and our caregiving systems as if they're infrastructure. Every time we think about economic recovery and stimulus, oftentimes the first thing we jump to is, you know, what's, how, what's the infrastructure investment and what are the shovel-ready projects? And I mean, the care system, shovel-ready, job-ready, <laughs> ready yeah. to go to help get America back to work. And I think that investing there is an investment in our health and our well-being in so many ways, including um, economically. It's wild to hear you say that, to use the word infrastructure, where you're actually talking about a structure and a backbone and something that needs real investment and recognition as like, this holds up a country because that has that's not a framing that I've ever heard before. And it's, that's, probably on me, but I just like that word is amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. And do you just mind saying um, for people what universal family care is? And I know I first read about an op-ed in the New York Times last year by you um, and your collaborators, um, but if you don't mind, and then I'll ask some audience questions that are coming up. Great, yeah. Universal family care is the idea that there should be one fund that all of us contribute to, that all of us can benefit from, 
that helps us afford childcare, long-term care, and paid family leave. Basically everything we need to take care of our families across the lifespan while we're working. Mm -hmm. right? It just assumes that we're all working and we also have family right. that we're responsible for and that we can't do it alone, that it is actually a collective responsibility in the 21st century, especially as people live longer, uh, millennials having children, everybody out in the workforce, we need a new infrastructure to support our caregiving needs and universal family care is, is that idea. And a little bit analogous or a lot analogous to social security or Medicare or like a large social program. Exactly. Net, right? Social insurance works super yeah. well for a program like this because it works well when there's large risk pools, right? Yes. And this would be the yeah. largest pool in history. <laughs> yes, totally. Um, I'm gonna peek at the chat. Um, Okay. Oh, okay. So here's it. Uh, um, despite the challenges right now, what gives you hope? You know, I do believe, and I've seen every single day evidence of this. I think it's an evidence-based belief <laughs> that we are, in fact, a really caring, connected country. And the Coronavirus Care Fund, I mean, we launched it and more than 105,000 individuals have contributed to the fund. And it just is an indication to me of how much people want to support other people and stay connected. And, yeah. um, and I just, I think that this is the time. I mean, every, every day at seven, when we all go out and clap for mm -hmm. our frontline workers, there's something really powerful there about what it says about who we are. And if you listen for it, you can hear it everywhere. And that's what I think we have to channel in our legislative efforts. So our policymakers really hear it um, and to each other, to remind each other of just how caring people, um, people we really are. Yeah. Um, uh, another question. Um, I'm curious what your answer to that question would be, Lucy. What, what gives me hope? Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, gee, I don't know the answer. I mean, it's like, so I love your answer. I agree with that totally. Um, I think like the, the people, like the, the people I see in front of me doing beautiful work, right? Um, you know, and that includes everybody like, um, I don't know, I think distance as a form of caring gives me hope, but also just looking at how much people care. I mean, like the environmental services staff in our clinic figured out, like has learned how to put on PPE to clean mm -hmm. our clinic, right? Because it's COVID clinic at Stanford. And mm -hmm. like people showed up to redo the HVAC and the ceiling so that COVID patients can be there and other patients can feel safe. And I don't know, something about just like, now we do 70% of our visits by video and we didn't hardly do any of them before. And that actually works well for a lot of people and will probably stick around in the future. So I don't know, I think just seeing how fast people are coming up with ideas right now um, and mm -hmm. operationalizing like some of these ways to be safe and then I think and like take care of each other just like quick 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 like we have to do this so we're going to do it I think it gives me hope in a way and it also makes me think like gosh you have to have a big force to get people to like to make a case in a c-suite or to what I like make stuff happen and I think I feel hopeful by how quickly things can change but I also think okay well what's the way to get big changes like that to stick. Um, uh, and it's like, you think about the analogy to things like climate, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's not fossil fuels being burned right now, but it's not a climate solution unless it's a just solution. Like this is not that. So, but it's like, how do you take like the justice that's coming out of this and like hold on to it for the people who need it now, for the people who need it across the world? I don't know. I think, 
it's like hopeful and spooky, right? Because it's like a little bit demoralizing to be like, oh, this is how quickly we could change. Like based on like a, a big fear that affects everybody, great. Like that's existed for a long time for a lot of people. And like, mm-hmm. you know, let's roll. I think um, it's both. And then, um, sorry, that was such a rambly answer, but that, no, no, that's I'm like a sure. kernel of something. <laughs> and then, um, uh, yeah, and then I just think like, Literally, you give me hope, I, Jen, because I do feel like you can have something that is deeply felt to you, right? Like the equality of human beings, the value of everybody. But I think a person like you who takes those truths and then actually puts them into pragmatic, um, practical, sellable policy, um, gives me a ton of hope because um because that feels like it has teeth um and it feels like something to support and get around you know and i think like there's such a revolution in in making in making that um like real policy that's going to work for real people i think it's like writing the future of america i hope so um anyway Mm -hmm. i hope so too yeah um, we deserve it. Sorry? We deserve it. Totally, totally. Um, and you hope it's like, I, you hope, I'm sure everybody hopes um, that they, like as we're moving into an election year and a platform year, right, to be building a democratic pa- platform in particular, that this can be operationalized as part of that. Um, so if there's ways for us to support doing that, I mean, I'm sure like on the list we're talking about, you talked about legislative concerns and how to support those. And then to be paying workers who come into your own home, whether or not they're coming in right now and then bringing them safely back. Um, and obviously voting is a big part of that. And I've heard you talk a lot about, it's not just your vote, but it's how to bring in your whole network into thinking about voting, um, and making voting happen. Um, yeah, and that's more important than ever, given how um, how isolated we all are and just how much mm-hmm. devastation and crisis there is mm-hmm. for all of us super citizens who are paying attention and know how important it is to vote. Every ounce of rallying that we can do of our networks and disseminating information about how to do this, uh, how to engage safely, I think is going to be key to us having a real election here. Um, is there anything else that you would add a question that's coming in um, for specifics is anything else you would add about and I think this will have to be our last question I'm sorry to say um, what each of us can be doing for the caregivers in our lives right now um, in addition Mm -hmm. to seeing them yes so um, certainly call your member of Congress as we said and right now we're doing a campaign called care for all Mm -hmm. Um, And this week's challenge and next week's challenge is called the Rosie Challenge, where we're asking everyone to take a Rosie selfie. Do your best Rosie pose. Like Rosie the Riveter? Yeah, Yeah, Rosie the Riveter. We're sort of channeling the kind of um, post-war era, kind of women really anchoring and powering our country forward. The fact that so many caregivers are in our homes powering us through this crisis and Um, just really wanting to share those stories and uplift those caregivers in this moment. So take your best Rosie selfie and post it on social, tag your member of Congress and say care for all, and maybe a few other friends too, so that they do it as well. And one really kind of open secret is that members of Congress are also home, so they're on Twitter a lot and it actually really makes a difference when you tweet at them. Good to know, good to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. (laughs) Great. Um, I think we're getting to time. Um, I wanted to close, if it's okay and not too cheesy, by reading you a piece of a poem. And there's a poem, or reading everybody a piece of a poem that um, your work makes me think of by opening up so much possibility and thinking about unlocking all the human potential that exists um, in this country. And um, this is a poem called A Brave and Startling Truth by Maya Angelou. Do you know it? No. It's really pretty. It's long. And basically, so I, I want to read the last three stanzas. And, stanzas. and she, in this poem, she keeps repeating 
the phrase, when we come to it. And she's sort of asking this question of what is the true miracle of the world? And then she keeps saying, when we come to it about that. Um, so she, these are, this is the last bit just for like a minute. So she says, we, this people on this small and drifting planet whose hands can strike with such abandon that in a twinkling life is sapped from the living. Yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness that the haughty neck is happy to bow and the proud back is glad to bend out of such chaos of such contradiction. We learn that we are neither devils nor divines. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth, a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when, and only when, we come to it. So thank you for helping us come to that, um, or at least a little closer every day. And um, please, everybody hang up and call your member of Congress right away and um, donate to the Coronavirus Care Fund, find iGen's work and read about her beautiful, um, uh, brilliant work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thanks. Have a good one.